Dr. Agrawal currently is the director of CSR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi. He graduated in medicine from AIMS in 1994, followed by specialization in internal medicine, pulmonary disease, and critical care from Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, and PhD in physiology from Delhi University. His research activities include experimental and computational model systems to study disease, especially asthma. Dr. Agrawal believes health data analytics with artificial intelligence applications to be the new frontier of medicines and is actively engaged in promoting medicine and informatics co confluence. Dr. Agrawal has recognized has been recognized internationally, nationally for his contributions to genomics and was awarded uh, Batnagar and National Biosense Awards and many others. He serves an advisory capacity to many organizations such as Public Health Foundations of India. Now, Dr. Agrawal, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamathaya. Let me just share my screen. I hope you can see my slides. And it's wonderful to be following Gareth because I think his talk sets up beautifully what it means to have rare disease in India. The simplest way I can put it is the title of my slide. We are a country where one in thousand means a million. And the meaning of the word rare becomes progressively uh, more challenging when you look at these numbers. Uh, so India is a great place to study genetics. At one level, we are amongst the most diverse places on this earth. We have, there is no Indian race. I mean, ethnically, we are uh, a mixture of all kinds of races. But within the sub-communities of India, we are very small endogamous groups. So we are the most and the least diverse at the same time. And many genetic diseases of a very large variety run at a very high prevalence inside these sub-communities because of a close-knit inbred family structure. To illustrate the first point that India is extremely diverse, I have plotted uh, the Indian various sub-communities on a principal component map where Yoruba African population is to the left, the European Cef is to the top right, and the Chinese Han is the bottom right. And you can see that various sub-communities of India pretty much span everything from CIF uh, to HAN. And this became the cover page of a paper from one of our sister laboratories talking about meeting the ancestors, where it shows that India has been one of the critical points where humans come out of Africa, settle down, create civilization, then create multiple movements back and forth. On a different index, there is something called identity by descent. Now, let me explain that to you. If parents are related to each other, you will have large segments which are identical on both your father, paternal and maternal chromosomes. Now, looking at a distribution, looking at the frequency of long segments of identity on paternal and maternal chromosomes, you can say how inbred populations are. So let me uh, look, if you look at this graph towards the right, at the top where it says YRI and CEF, this is what European or African populations would look like, extremely outbred. You can see where Ashkenazi Jews are marked over here and the Finns are marked over here. And you can see they are only halfway down this graph. As you start coming to the bottom of the graph, these are the Indian populations. In genetics textbooks, we talk about Finns or Ashkenazi Jews as examples of highly inbred populations with a high element of genetic diseases. And yet, you can look from this graph quantitatively that most Indian large subcommunities are five to 10 times more inbred than these populations. Then why don't we see much more genetic disease than what we see already? And the most obvious reason is that we don't look for it. In fact, this became one of the cover pages of Nature Genetics some time ago by Dr. Thangaraj, one of my colleagues, where he shows that deleterious mutations are actually common all over the world. And you can see them as, you know, people colored half. So they will be recessive 
And if you have only one copy, you stay healthy. But in India, there are many communities we can find when we look for them, not without looking for them, where homozygous conditions are very common. And India might be one of the centers for genetic disease in this world. So do we need community-based screening? Jewish communities had faced this problem earlier. And they started programs like Dor Yashram, built on the premise that fat, fatal and debilitating genetic disorders have absolutely no reason to be perpetuated. You heard in the previous talk about primary, secondary and tertiary preventions. And one good example of this particular program, which is uh, basically very prevalent in some communities in Israel, is that Tay-Sachs disease for which it was started is now virtually gone. Can we do something like that in India? And what? how far are we? Here is an example just to illustrate this point. Almost any doctor in South India who takes care of these populations knows that in the Arya Vasya population, you cannot give saxamethonium. It's actually pretty uncommon. But we see one in 24 people in this community having homozygous silent mutations. Very simple example of classical pharmacogenomics that simply is known to the doctors but has never re really reached the genetics world. In India, a patient with a disease goes through eight physician visits, three misdiagnoses, and seven plus years to diagnosis. Even if the disease was reversible or controllable, the opportunity is typically lost. So what can we do about it? My institute has two major programs. We have one program called Guardian, Genomics for Understanding Rare Diseases, in which we do discovery of the rare disease variants responsible for genetic diseases in India, and we convert them under the second program called GOMET, Genomics and Other Omics Tools for Enabling Medical Decisions to Affordable Tests. Basically, Guardian runs on sequencing as one of the primary ways of discovery, and GOMED runs as a simpler, as far as possible, uh, simple nucleic acid diagnostics for translating it and making it available to populations. Both these programs have been running for quite some time now. I'll take only one quick case study to show the capacity of the system. Spinocerebellar ataxia is one of the commonest neurological diseases, many types, some familiar, subtle clinical differences, the Indian spectrum was barely known. As recently back as 10 years ago, samples were typically sent to foreign labs and new types of SCAs were discovered from Indian patients actually outside. It took about 20 years. In these 20 years, my um, parent medical institute, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and my current institute, Institute of Genomics Integrative Biology, work together to map at-risk populations, find common founder mutations, create genetic testing services, keep adding to comprehensive mutation databases as we discovered them through NGS, particularly novel mutations, and start community intervention programs, and eventually end up with models, immortalized cell lines where R&D could be done. We probably have the largest such repository in the world, which is not a surprise given the population of India, and as I explained to you, the higher frequency of rare genetic diseases. And this of course is not an SCA, but we have found communities where, you know, uh, the founder mutation might be found in 10% of the population, not very uncommon for us. We have been able to describe the mutants, create the tests, make them available through LAL path labs and other path labs in the country. And very importantly, simultaneously able to bring repository of stem cells of affected patients that can be used to actually look at new drugs coming out. And this was very important when the University of Wisconsin for one of these diseases was able to come up with a new drug, but they were limited in terms of access to immortalized cells that they could study the efficacy of the drug in. And that was a very nice collaboration that happened. Sometimes it leads us into very interesting directions. This was a 29 year old businessman from Eastern India with fever and joint pains. Ultimately on whole exome sequencing, we saw mutations that actually um, were not common in India, but are common in Persian ancestry. And because we've had long standing collaborations across the Middle East, 
uh, we had that in our databases. And when you think about it, uh, Middle East and India has a very long history together. And we were able, again, using this to find smaller communities within India with Persian ancestry from the time of the Mughals who have mostly stayed within their own community and are a hotspot for many of these diseases. And of course, this is a very obvious thing to those of us who know Indian history that uh, Arabs and Indians have had a very long contact with each other. And this Elmina database that we now manage with them now makes many of these variants available globally. My institute has been very active in trying to understand genetic diversity in Asia. We were, of course, the first uh, in this country to perform whole genome sequencing. Uh, many other countries, their first human genomes and their capacity either was done at IGIB or analyzed by us or in collaboration with us. And you can see the marks all over South Asia. And that's been a very enriching experience for us to both give and take and learn. Like I said, these are our two major programs. One of them is a discovery platform where we ask questions from unknown diseases. Today, we have an ability to solve 30 to 40% of undiagnosed diseases coming to us. And every time we discover one, given our community substructure, the applicability of that mutation to the population tends to be higher. So we are usually able to convert it into a usable population-based test that could be as simple as a PCR. We are currently running this program called Indigen. Now it's going to be called Indigen Med, which is genomics for public health in India, in which we start sequencing large fractions of these subcommunities in India. Uh, the basic beginning has been made where the first 1000 Indians uh, were sequenced and the whole genomes have been done. And this will be extended to 10,000 people in the next two years. And we expect the number to cross 100,000 over the next five years. This is being supported as a mission program by the government of India and Council of Scientific Industrial Research and Department of Biotechnology, two of its component structures. One of the very important problems we struggle with for which we are using India's strength in informatics is we are in an area where a report that you generate is out of date within a week. In fact, it may be out of date by the time the patient receives it because so many unknown variants exist when, when, I, when I spoke about these thousand genome variations, we added 12 million previously unknown variants to the global databases. So many of these have unknown functional significance. As you learn more, the interpretation would change. Yet you have to maintain a lot of privacy and ethics. So we have come up with a genome information card containing a code that can be read by an app. The app has a patient interface and a doctor interface. Both people receive very different kind of reports when they scan. Uh, the card is linked on the back end to the complete sequencing that has been performed for them, which means every time they scan, the scan, interpre the, uh, the interpretation can be updated. In fact, on our servers, on a test case, we are now repeating these analysis periodically and measuring the degree of change as in the world of genomics, we learn more and more. This is the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Harshwardhan for India launching this idea of a genome card that we plan to make a personal genome card for communities that are heavily afflicted to start with and then extending to the rest of India. Uh, I will not speak much about this, but we have been doing significant work on new generations of CRISPRs capable of very, very precise, very specific therapeutic genome editing. Uh, these are far better than the versions currently available in the world. These are being done with Japan. One of them shows about 90% um, lower off target than current CRISPR trials that are ongoing. That we have already done for sickle cell disease now, and has gone to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles for humanized mouse work with stem cell corrections. Many other things that we can talk about on a different day. Uh, one very important thing we realize is that we need to increase the awareness for genomics amongst medical professionals. We've been helped by global giants, including Sanofi, in taking these things forward. And every year, we try to train more doctors. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agrawal. It's very enlightening and interesting and exciting. Um, 